Amen. By the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, as uh, one of our brothers said, that uh, we don't look at the crowd, but we look at the word of the Lord that said, but if it is me and my family, we shall continue to serve God. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, our family, we continue to serve God in Jesus' name. Uh, the most important thing we want to announce today is that we shouldn't forget the Thursday prayer meeting. Let us continue to call all those people who are members of the church to continue to greet them and establish the kingdom in the faith. And as God is doing so by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, this spirit will pass away in the name of Jesus Christ. And the name of the Lord shall be glorified in our life in Jesus' name. We shouldn't forget the Saturdays, Oka Ame, prayer meeting, free three hour of free three. And then let us continue to invite every one of them that they are online. And then as we are doing to Almighty God, we continue to establish us in Jesus' name. As soon as the Sunday service, we surely come up within our family. As we have said, if it is me and my family, we shall continue to serve God. If there's any other announcement or if there's any other thing from the headquarters, uh, we let us know. Now we shall listen to the Bible reading. As we read your word today, we're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother, and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits and to the wizards. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up, and they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up, the reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax and they that weave networks shall be confounded. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Neither shall there be any work for Egypt, which the head or tail, branch or rush, may do. In that day shall Egypt be like unto women, 
and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord, and perform it. And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Chapter 20 In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and fought against Ashdod, and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia their expectation and of Egypt their glory. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whither we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And how shall we escape? Chapter two, The Burden of the Desert of the Sea As whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the sighing thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. The Burden of Duma. He calleth to me out of Seir, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return, come. The Burden Upon Arabia. 
In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, and all the glory of Kedar shall fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, we should pity the man in this world who was used the end for a bed. And I guess we should pity the man who was torn from dust, filled us for bread. But this can be rich if they have contentment and sharing for salvation plan but if you know any who though they have plenty and lost then pity the man A builder who builds all the sand. For a king to be saved is a thing. If it's lost, then pity a man.
I guess there are those who pity the saved as though they were missing life's best. Forgetting the treasures of earth pass away and that heaven's the place to invest. Oh, meanwhile, a seeming the man who is scheming to hold up the world that he can. But if while he's living to God is not giving his soul, then pity the man. Pity. The giver of life, traveler, romantic, a builder who build on the sand. Papa rocking to be saved is the thing lost and pity the man. What a good God you are. What a great Father you are. You know what's ahead. And you don't want us to be taken by surprise. That's the reason you brought us together in this retreat. So we can sing through and so we can praise through and so we can plunge ourselves into the river of your mercy and your favor. And so that your fire, your power, the anointing and also the breaking of every yoke will take place in every life. Lord, we pray at this time again, reveal yourself very clearly to every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, we know we are not the first set of people you are revealing yourself to. You revealed yourself to people of old and a lot of them benefited from that revelation. Some of them did not benefit. And these things are written for learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are praying, Lord, you make us wise. And this time of your favor and mercy, we pray, Lord, we receive everything you have for us in Jesus' name. Make us strong. Make us wise. Make us bold and courageous in the day of evil, that we will be able to stand and nothing will defeat us in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We know you are going to give us all the power we need for this present hour. Do it for us, Lord. We receive by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. 
God bless you. You can see now. We've come to consider a message from the Word of God that looks very peculiar. And the Lord wants to reveal to us what we need to know for the present hour and for the future ahead of us. We're talking about escape from the power and influence of Sodom. That word escape, it means there is danger, peril, difficulty, a time that will catch everybody unawares. And yet the Lord has prepared a way, a way of escape. That word escape we find in many parts of scripture. Let me point a few of them to you. One, as the Lord himself used that word escape. We're looking at Luke chapter 21 verse 36. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. The Lord is saying, a time is coming, a time of peril, a time of danger, a time of judgment, a time of punishment for the world. And he's saying, we need to watch. And we need to pray so that we will be accounted worthy to escape what's coming upon the people of the world. Then he's telling us in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Again, we're looking at the word escape. It's going to take something from you. It's going to demand something from you so that you will escape and you'll not be caught in the trial, tribulation, and in the trouble coming upon the people of the world because it will come upon them unprepared, come upon them unawares. But the Lord is saying, we will escape. We're going to escape in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect? How shall we escape if we neglect? He's sending messages to us through his servants, many of us through his prophets, many of us, and through his appointed, anointed preachers, many of us. And then he's saying, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. First generation Believers are always very vigilant and watchful. Those who just came to the gospel at the first time, at the beginning of the church, the early church, always watchful. But the people that come second generation, third generation, first generation, they are mostly careless. When you think about the church, the early church, the church of the Acts of the Apostles, you find that devotion to the world, and you find that devotion to all the instructions, the commandments of the Lord, taking heed. But after you come, second generation, and third generation, and the fourth generation, then religion takes over from righteousness. And then the people are no more careful, are no more watchful, are no more serious about preparation for the coming of the Lord. 
That's what you'll find here. The people at the time that Paul wrote to the Hebrews, this is not the first generation. You have now second generation, third generation. And he's saying, how shall we escape? So great, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first, that is the first generation of Christians, they heard it, they knew it, they embraced it. At the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and then was confirmed unto us by them. This is another generation now, by them that heard him. God also bearing witness, both for signs and wonders and diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. I'm sure you know that many of us who are here now are the retreat. You are not the first generation of believers in our church deep alive. You came much later. And the vigilance of the early days, maybe you don't have. The watchfulness of the early days, maybe you don't have. The passion of the early days, maybe you don't have. And the seriousness of taking heed to the word of God, maybe you don't have. That's why the Lord is saying, second generation believers, third generation believers, first generation believers, understand we are nearer the end than at the beginning. And so he says, how will you escape if you neglect so great salvation? We're not going to neglect. I said we're not going to neglect. That has come, you understand, the Lord is preparing you and preparing us all together for the coming of the Lord so that we will escape what is coming upon this world. We're talking about escaping from the power of Sodom. The influence of Sodom. And let's look at the reason we're saying that. We're now back in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Talking about Sodom, the power of the sinful world, the authority of the sinful world, the influence of the sinful world. The men of Sodom were wicked. Not only wicked, they were sinners in the sight of the Lord. And it says, exceedingly. And the Lord is telling us that we're living in the world, and the world in which we live in is like Sodom, sinful, wicked. And you know there's a word that came out of that name of the city, Sodom, Sodomites. Sodomites, those are men with men, messing up together. A lady and another lady messing up together. It started in Sodom. And if you have been listening to what is going on in the world in which we live today, Sodomy. Sodomites are even now appearing. They're not just sneaking into some churches. They're now even asking for ordination to become preachers and ministers. And in some countries right now, you will be penalized by the government if you spoke directly against sodomites. Men and men getting married together, adopting children, and saying that they are married and they want you to recognize the marriage. The marriage of a man and another man. The marriage of a woman and another, and another woman. They want you to give that public recognition. Not only that, they want you to be able to also give them employment. No discrimination. They have a right. We have these last days coming upon us. And it's telling us that we need to escape the power and the influence of Sodom. 
Let's look at Jeremiah. You're not going away from Genesis. And then you see that the influence and the power, the corruption, and the evil and the sinfulness of Sodom even continued beyond the time of Genesis. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, we're looking at verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery, prophets, preachers, so-called servants of God, and they walk in lies, destroying them also, the hands of evil doers, that none does return from his wickedness, they are all of them unto me. Tell me the next thing there. As Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. It's talking about the prophets, the preachers, the priests, the ministers in the church. And he's saying, they are unto me like Sodom and like Gomorrah. What do they do? They strengthen the hands of evil doers. The influence of Sodom. The influence of Gomorrah. And it's saying the people that sin and the people that do evil instead of the prophets of God rising up and condemning the sin and then speaking with a fiery voice and message against evil. It says, destroy them, the hands of evil doers. And then it says, those prophets and priests and pastors and preachers, they become like unto me, the people of Sodom. Look at verse 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. That's the influence of Sodom. And we're praying that this church, the Palais Bible Church, in every country, in Africa, in Europe, in America, Latin America, Asia, everywhere, we as a church together will escape the power and the influence of Sodom in Jesus' name. I told you that because we're second, third, fourth, perhaps, generation of believers, the kind of attitude we had against sin, against evil, against wickedness, against corruption in the earlier days, we're praying as a church, we'll have that same fiery attitude. Against sin, we'll have it back in the church in Jesus' name. So that you don't have a favorite that is committing sin and backsliding, committing adultery and fornication and doing evil and then supporting them it's my man. It's from my tribe. It's from my village. It's my relative. It's a person close to me. Don't touch him. Let him corrupt the church. Let him cause people to backslide. Let him bring in all the influences of Sodom. It's my man. It's my lady. Leave him. Leave her. That is the influence of Sodom. And we're praying that from tonight and permanently in our church, the Lord will purge out all the influence of Sodom in the church in Jesus' name. 
We're not looking at Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. I'm reading from verse 45. Escape from the power and the influence of Sodom. Jeremiah chapter 51. We're looking at verse 45. My people, go ye out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. He's saying that the Lord is commanding us, challenging us, that the influence of Sodom is so near. And you know, we are around many other churches and many of us, we even have some members of other churches living in your house. And even your community and your share notes to share ideas together. And they tell you this is what they do in their church. And this is how they operate in their church. And this is how they act in their church. And this is what they permit in their church. The other church is so loving and they're all in fellowship. And they hear about what we do over here. And they hear about our stand against evil and against sin. And the way we want all the people associated with this church, not just workers, members. And the moment you come in here and then you hear the word of God, we're expecting everyone associated with this church to stand straight and to come out from among them. And then when you compare notes, they say, uh -uh. they do that in your church. And they're so militant in your church. Oh yes, to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Oh, they say, well, you know, in our own church, a pastor, what can he do? Once in a while, he preaches and says, stand straight and stand firm. And when the people don't, uh, you know, do it, you say, God bless you. In any case, whatever you do, whether you are good or bad or sinful or righteous, I'm a pastor, I'm just going to love you. I'm going to have a place in my heart for everything that you do. But no, here is different. We are seeing first generation believers keep the fire burning and keep the fervency and keep the challenge you had and the conviction you had in the earlier days. If possible, you even want to become more fiery than you were when you came in. And then the second generation, third generation, fourth generation believers, they are just coming to the church. And the Lord is saying, there should be unity of conviction. And you see at my back here, it says, earnestly contained for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, you might have to just, you know, brush some people aside. You might have to discipline some people. You might have to check some people. Don't do that. You can't go that direction. You might have to frown at some people. Whatever we have to do to make sure that this church does not get infiltrated, influenced by the power and attitude of Sodom. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to be in agreement with the leadership of the church in Jesus' name. You know, that's what is keeping this church from the influence of Sodom. Our state overseers, as fiery as the general superintendent, our region overseers as uncompromising as the general superintendent. Our group coordinators here at the headquarters and our coordinators over here are leaders over here, as sectional leaders over here, as firm and as fierce and as fervent and as focused as the general superintendent. And I pray that that firmness and focus will remain forever with us in this church in Jesus' name. And of course, I'm sure you know coordinators who are here, group coordinators who are here. I'm sure you are not waiting for me anymore. Gone are the days when somebody commits sin and somebody does something that is not all right. And we say, we're waiting for the pastor. You're not waiting for the pastor anymore. What you know I would have done. Do it in your district, in your group. Something takes place. That the influence of Sodom is coming into a local church. And that the corruption of the world is coming into a local church. You are a coordinator there. You are the pastor there. 
and you are the group coordinator, you are the pastor there, and you see that if the general superintendent were here, he will not allow this, then deal with it. Don't wait for me. Don't say, I'm going to wait when the GS comes back from his trip, then he will handle this. No, I've transferred the authority to your hand. Handle that. And the coordinator is a pastor of that church, and you are over every section of the church. The men, the women, the youths, the children, the choir, the orchestra, the ushers, the security in that local church. They are under the leadership of the pastor in that church. And if anything goes wrong, and the influence of Sodom is trying to come into that local church from any direction. Don't say, if it were GS, this is what you will do. I'll show you the example. What I would have done, that's what you do. Even if you have to make some group of people sit back and sit down and say, hey, come on. This is Sodom. This is the influence of the world coming in here, and if the GS were here, this is what you will do. Do it, and you have my support and back it. We're together. I said we're together. It's going to be like that in Jesus' name. The same thing with our region overseers, state overseers, and national overseers. I will be telling you, you know, what I do over here when I see that the influence of Sodom is coming in. I take it over myself, and I say, no, this is the way walk ye therein. And God will help every one of us to stand by that word in Jesus' name. Are we together? I said, are we together? Of course, of course, of course. We have to be together because we are on our way to heaven. And that place, heaven, we are going to get there in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. I'm looking at verse 8. Revelation chapter 11. We're looking at verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You know, he was crucified in, in Jerusalem, but now even Jerusalem became like Sodom. And then we're told in Revelation here that even to, the, to that time that you find this city just like Sodom. If that could happen, we're coming from Genesis. And the influence and the power of Sodom began in Genesis. It went on to the time of Jeremiah, went on to the New Testament, and went on unto the time of the Revelation. That's why the Lord is telling us that we need to find out if the power, the sinfulness, the attitude, the corruption of Sodom is coming into the church. This day is going to be pushed out of our church in Jesus' name. Escape from the power and escape from the influence of Sodom. I'm going to talk on three points. Number one, the description of the sinfulness of Sodom. The description of the sinfulness of Sodom. Number two, the danger of saints in Sodom and Sodom in saints. The danger of saints in Sodom and Sodom in saints. Number three, the deliverance of saints from Sodom. Number one, the description of the sinfulness of Sodom. We're looking at Genesis chapter 13 again. Genesis chapter 13. Let's see the description of the word of God concerning Sodom. The description of the sinfulness of Sodom. Genesis 13, reading from verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
even as the garden of the of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lord chose him on the plain of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and they separated themselves, one the one from the other. Abraham, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. He didn't go to Sodom immediately. He just pitched his tent near, separating from the man of God, from the friend of God, from Abraham. And then he pitched his tent near Sodom. And then he says, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Let's look at chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 20. Genesis chapter 18 verse 20. We're told, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. You think about what the Lord is saying, what the Lord said about Sodom. He said, their cry is great. The crime is terrible, and their sin is very grievous in the sight of the Lord. Verse 21, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of each, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Look at verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Paradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? And then the Lord said, that it goes on in verse 26 and the Lord said if I find in Sodom how many righteous people tell me out loud 50 righteous within the city I will spare all the place for their sakes the Lord said Abraham I'm listening to you you're making intercession if I see 50 righteous people there in Sodom I'll be patient for them. I'll wait for them. I'll wait for those 50 to influence them, turn them around. He continued praying, and then we're told in verse, now we're now in verse 32. Look at verse 32. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. But you know the Lord was not able to find ten righteous people in Sodom. And the righteous people we are even talking about, we're not talking about, uh, you know, people who are, you know, saved soundly and then righteous and holy and sanctified. We're talking about people like Lord. And you know the righteousness of Lord. The righteousness of Lord was the minimal level of righteousness. And that's the kind of righteousness the Lord was even saying, if I find 10 people minimally righteous like Lord, minimally righteous like his daughters, minimally righteous like his wife, if I find 10 in that place, I will spare them. Even with that minimum level of righteousness, God could not find 10 people there that had minimal righteousness. That makes you to know then the description of the sinfulness of Sodom. Let's look at Genesis chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 4. Genesis chapter 19 verse 4. How sinful Sodom was. How terrible Sodom was. The kind of crime they had. Chapter 19, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. And he called unto Lord, and he said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, 
that we may know them. The word know there is not to want to know their names. No more than that. Once you see their faces, no more than that. They wanted to know them as her husband knows the wife. You see, and Adam knew his wife Eve. That means they came together. And that's what they wanted to do here. We want to know them. We want to have something with them. We want to defile them. And then it says in verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him. And then and he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. You understand now when he say, I want to know them. If it's just to see their face, that's not wickedness. If it's just to know their names, that's not wickedness. If it's to know from which country are you, what are you doing here? You want to settle here? You want to trade here? You need accommodation here? You need land here? Let's know you. Let's know who you are before we give you land. That's not wickedness. It's the sinfulness of sodomy. Is a sinfulness of man and man walking that which is so seemly defiling their own bodies. That's why Lord said, do not do so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And you do unto them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. You know what they were asking for then? They wanted to have immorality. And he said, okay, if you want immorality, look at the man who was saying he's righteous. Look at this man, he says, well, he said, number one sin is too terrible. But number two sin can be is less. Uh, sodomy is terrible. But my daughters are here. They don't know any man. Can I give them to you? That's a smaller sin. That's a lighter sin. That's the righteous man we're talking about here. That even the people could not be as righteous as that. He serious sin because to him, defiling his daughters, they will not be as terrible as defiling. Pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. The angels performed great miracles and made all those men of Sodom blind. But look at it, after that blindness was small and great. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. After they were stricken blind. They still wanted to commit the sin seriously. And they were looking for the door. Where is the door? Where is the door? They knew that they were blind. And yet they could not find the door. And they wearied themselves in wanting to find the door. That shows you then how sinful they were. And the Lord will deliver us from this kind of lifestyle in Jesus' name. It be good. Amen. But you know, brothers and sisters, sin comes in little by little by little you open the door a little and then sin will stick in one leg and then stick in the second leg before you know what the whole scene is there and this is what happened to lord he pitched his tent near sodom later he went into sodom later he mixed with the people later he wanted to be a judge over the people and later he mixed with them he became almost part of them. And when you allow sin in any form, sin in any shape, a little, a little, a little, before you know what, the spirit of Sodom and the power of Sodom and the attitude of Sodom and the lifestyle of Sodom will creep in and then stay inside. I pray that God from tonight will purge this church from the influence of Sodom in Jesus' name. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24. 1 Kings chapter 14. We're reading from verse 24. Remember now we're coming all the way from Genesis. And now we're going far, and we're talking about hundreds of years, thousands of years now, after Genesis. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24. 
it says, and there were also Sodomites in the land. And there were also Sodomites in the land. Can you imagine that after the judgment came? That influence of Sodo, of Sodomy, of Sodom, it remained. And that corruption of Sodom still remained. That's why we're saying, although we have left them in Genesis, and God had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, yet the crime, yet the sin, yet the evil, yet the corruption of Sodom was still there. Verse 24, and, and there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You see, way, way off, away, far away in First Kings, it was still there. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. That attitude of Sodom remained in the land of Israel. The influence was terrible of Sodom. Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 2. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's creep. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider a ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They are forsaking the Lord. They are provoked the Holy One of Israel unto